Hey everyone, no need to hide in the rafters. We can all come out into the light and enjoy as we are in the thick of Sting Timber. It's Sting! It's hard to find someone in the wrestling world who's worked for more major North American companies than Sting. Yes, we know about Jeff Jarrett, but this is Sting Timber after all. Across a 36 year career, the man played pivotal roles in WCW, TNA, WWE, and of course, most recently, AEW. It's safe to say that the history of wrestling in this country can be traced through the career of the master of the Scorpion Deathlock. Sting is unquestionably an icon, not just because of his longevity and his ability to change with the times, but for his ability to withstand even the lamest of booking. And when it comes to the Stinger, there was a lot of that. And this week, I'm gonna rank them the top eight worst moments of Sting. Don't worry folks, I'm not gonna touch moment of truth. Number eight, Joker Sting. I might get some pushback on this one because from what I've seen, people either loved Joker Sting or they hated him. In my opinion, I do think it diluted his brand a bit. In 2011, Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff made their way to Impact Wrestling, and while their opening statement spoke of building the company up, Sting began warning anyone who would listen that the two were not to be trusted. As his protests fell on deaf ears, the Stinger became unhinged and transformed into the insane icon. You nervous? Cause you be. I mean, if I had spent the better part of the last 30 years not being believed by my peers despite almost always being proven right, yeah, I'd go a little crazy too. This new variant earned the nickname of Joker Sting since he would cackle and make funny faces while cutting promos and committing violent attacks on his rival Hulk Hogan. And of course, his trademark face paint had changed to something resembling Heath Ledger's portrayal of the Joker in The Dark Knight. And much like when Sting transformed into the Crow, he waited about three years until the original movie had come out to cop the look. This version was short-lived compared to his other looks. Once Sting beat Hogan at Bound for Glory 2012, there was no more need for it, with a recent exception made in AEW, kinda. It's showtime. I know Sting has gone on record as saying that the Joker was his favorite version to play because he got to be more like himself and joke around and make silly voices, but it was still weird to see this 50-year-old man base his look on an idea that had already been played out so much in popular culture by that point, jumping from one old piece of IP to another, like putting a hat on top of another hat. Just leave the multiple personality thing to Mick Foley. Number 7. Sting is Stupid the problem with being a babyface is that eventually someone's going to betray you. It might happen to you more than once, but few wrestlers have been known specifically for their repeat victimization quite like Sting. Sting got stabbed in the back a lot over the years. As mentioned recently here on the channel, it was in the winter of 1990 when Sting was invited into the Four Horsemen, though the partnership was brief, as Flair and the Andersons beat up the Stinger for not giving up his world title shot. And ironically, their segment later in the night did more real damage to Sting than the earlier beatdown ever could. Then came November of 1991, when Sting was seduced by Medusa in a belly dancing outfit, allowing his best friend turned heel and then world champion and Lex Luger to get the drop on our hero. The attack would play a role in Sting losing the US title to Rick Rude later that night. And speaking of Luger, he turned his back on Sting again, in a sense, in 1996 during the famous NWO storyline, when he and the rest of the WCW locker room accused Sting of selling out and joining the Outlaw faction. I mean, this dude is clearly not Sting, yet his best friend couldn't figure it out from looking right at him? Come on! But the most egregious example came during the build to Halloween Havoc 1995. Tensions had exploded between Ric Flair and Arn Anderson, and soon Nate found himself in a two-on-one situation against Arn and Brian Pillman. Sting ultimately stepped up and offered to help Flair, though warning him he'd be quote, dead, dead, dead if he were double-crossed. Flair did promise Sting he would be on his best behavior, then, well, yeah. Ric Flair! Oh my God! And that's how the horsemen came back, kiddos. It's actually kind of amazing and is a testament to Sting's talent and likability that he stayed as popular as he did in WCW, considering how often they made him look like a gullible sap. Number 6. The WCW Mini Movies Again, I can see why some people might disagree with me putting these on the list. Hell, I'm kind of mad at myself to be honest about it. 
Spin the wheel, make the deal. White Castle of Fear, Beach Blast 93, long considered the holy triumvirate of cheesy wrestling promos, each starring Sting and whoever his big rival was at the time. A series of highly produced and heavily scripted scenarios involving our favorite wrestling stars facing off in locales like a seedy bar, a frozen mountain lair, and a beach. A trilogy of combustible tales all held together by the Stinger, and Cheatham the one-eyed midget for some reason. My name is John! Now you girls get on out of here! I can never tell if fans were supposed to be taking these skits seriously, at least if they were older than the age of 10. I mean, kayfabe was still relatively alive and well during this time, but it'd be hard to suspend disbelief when all these scenes end with explosions and cliffhangers, then everyone comes back to TV and everything's the same as before. Is this all meant to be normal wrestler stuff? The mini-movies were produced by Turner Home Entertainment, a company that shared its owner with WCW, but still operated separately from it, resulting in these films being totally removed from the realm of what we had typically seen in wrestling up to that point. It's hard to watch these today and not have a laugh over how silly it all is. But at the time, the tone of the WCW mini-movies was a bit too camp compared to how the wrestlers were portrayed on regular programming, and was seen as trying too hard to emulate the WWF's brand of entertainment. By the way, if you want to learn more about these films, you can check out the video I did way back in 2016 alongside Colt Cabana. Number 5. Victory Road 2011 Hey, absolutely none of this entry is on Sting. He is not to blame for this, okay? But this is still worst of Sting, and he was there! March 13th, 2011, Orlando, Florida. It's time for the main event of Victory Road, one of TNA's biggest events of the year. In a show with a couple of bright spots like Ultimate X and a Falls Count Anywhere match with Bully Ray and Tommy Dreamer, it also had an abysmal knockouts tag title match, a clunky Haas fight with Hernandez and Matt Morgan, a dud of a semi-main between Rob Van Dam and Mr. Anderson, and then the infamous world title match between Sting and Jeff Hardy. Hardy's career has been plagued with start and stop runs due to his history of substance abuse. But despite the risk involved with bringing Jeff into the fold, one thing no company has been able to deny over the years has been his unbridled charisma and fan appeal. The only problem with that, of course, is when said abuse bites you in the ass at the worst possible time. After vanishing for several hours in the lead up to their match, Hardy returned to the backstage area zonked out of his gourd and unable to tie his shoes, much less wrestle a main event contest. To TNA's credit, the folks in charge at the time were able to think on their feet and do their best to save things. Eric Bischoff came to the ring and gave Sting the Iggy to make the match short and sweet. A visibly irritated Sting grabbed a visibly inebriated Hardy and dropped him, holding him down for a quick and merciful end to the worst pay-per-view main event of all all time. Sometimes being the nicest guy in wrestling means having to put up with other people's mistakes and taking them in stride. It was not a pretty sight and it nearly tanked Jeff's career, but it could have gone much worse. Number 4. Sting Joins the Wolfpack there are times when even the strongest of heroes must sacrifice their ideals for the greater good, even if the greater good actually doesn't make a lick of sense. Nobody was more synonymous with the fight against the New World Order than the man called Sting. The guy spent a year and a half taking time off of wrestling and lurking in the shadows, waiting for just the right moment to strike back and defeat Hollywood Hogan and his devious pack of goons. Which he did, technically. More on that in a bit. Despite ultimately prying the world title from the Order's grasp, his time as champion was still secondary to the far more important storyline of the NWO's impending split into black and white and red and black. Sting lost the world title to Randy Savage after Kevin Nash interfered. Remember that now. But Savage hurt his knee in the match, forcing him to drop it to Hogan the following night on Nitro and missing the early days of the Wolfpack entirely. A recruiting drive for Sting's services came from both sides of the NWO war. And in the same building where he beat Hogan for the belt and got rescued by Robocop, the Stinger made his decision. After teasing that he would go Hollywood, it was actually a ruse. And before long, Sting went red. Oh man, that was a really weird look for him. No, 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 no thank you. So there you go, Sting would join the NWO Wolfpack, which featured Randy Savage and was led by Kevin Nash. It didn't really matter which side he joined, because by affiliating with any version of the NWO, Sting immediately threw aside everything he'd fought for since 1996. All for a pop. That's not too sweet. Number 3. Robocop like I said earlier, you could make a convincing argument in favor of the WCW mini-movies. This, though, 
not a chance. Many of WCW's biggest mistakes came from the intent of trying to beat the WWF at their own game, whether it was playing things more cheesy and family friendly, or just trying to embrace the larger pop culture landscape. But while the Federation got folks like Cyndi Lauper and Mr. T, WCW had to settle for a somewhat different 80s icon. As Sting was recovering from his knee injury in 1990, WCW landed a cross-promotional deal with the film RoboCop 2. It was then promised that the cyborg police officer himself would appear at the upcoming Capital Combat pay-per-view. Hmm, a law enforcement superweapon unleashed in Washington, D.C. God bless America! Sting made his way out to address the crowd when he was suddenly jumped by the horsemen. And what was their big nefarious scheme? Why, shoving him into a shark cage that had been left there after the previous match. Those bastards, how dare they do that to the Stinger? You know, just throwing him in the cage and closing and locking it up and just keeping him in there for a while. God knows how long it would take for a locksmith to show up. But wait, ambling down the aisle, it's RoboCop. Apparently the studio prohibited WCW from having RoboCop do anything physical, which meant all he could do to cause the horseman to flee was slowly lumber toward them as he bent the obviously rubber bars to help Sting escape and go back to catering, I guess. Oh yeah, and his armor fell apart just by walking. So yeah, good luck doing anything physical with that outfit for making their heels look like wimps and their top baby face like an awkward dork while also completely challenging the credibility of the entire enterprise, this one gets two thumbs down. Number two, Sting vs. Triple H, WrestleMania 31. I'm not gonna lie, part of me is a little embarrassed that I'm talking about so many things that I've already discussed on this channel. But hey, if recycling ideas is good enough for WWE in 2015, it's good enough for me. 2014 was quite the up and down year for WWE. Fans finally got the catharsis of Daniel Bryan's title win at WrestleMania 30, only for it to end prematurely due to injury. After more authority bullshit, the audience finally had another great feel-good moment when the Stinger debuted at Survivor Series to save the day for Dolph Ziggler. I went into detail about the failings of Sting's run in the company a long time ago, so I won't hit every point here, but by far the worst thing about it, not including his spinal injury, was his match with Triple H at WrestleMania 31. The corpse of the Monday Night War was exhumed once again as Sting was portrayed as the last soldier of WCW, despite having spent the last decade doing perfectly fine wrestling for a different company. That's right, this is what it's like, Sting! After commentary treated the former multiple-time world champion with condescension, the match also saw cameos by D-Generation X in Triple H's corner and the NWO in Sting's. You know, the same group that forced him to alter his entire persona just to fight? You know what? Forget about it. And to top it all off, the Stinger would be one of the few to actually put Hunter over at a WrestleMania. Then he shook hands with him like a dope. Just the worst. We just wanted Sting versus Taker, Vince! Before I give you my pick for number one, here are a couple of honorable mentions. The Black Scorpion. I think I should retire any Black Scorpion talk after this month. I've spent a lot of videos over the years talking about that storyline, including one just two weeks ago. I'm keeping it off the main countdown here just to put some new blood into it, but yeah, this is definitely a bad one. But it's not as if the idea was bad from the jump. If they had a payoff secured in place, and if they took a risk on someone unexpected under the hood, it could have been really interesting. Hell, I think I would have respected WCW more if they had just known from the start it was going to be Ric Flair, who only agreed to do it at the last minute on the condition that he win the title back just a few weeks later. Sting vs. Abyss whether it was the Ministry of Darkness, Vampiro, James Mitchell, or the Demon Dale Torborg, Vince Russo loved booking spooky and supernatural stuff, and this storyline had that in spades. Sting and Abyss's feud carried on for months in 2006 and into 2007, whether it was over the TNA Championship or merely for pride and survival. Case in point, the prison yard match at Against All Odds, the object of which was to throw your opponent into a small cage and lock the door tight. It was a fine match, but it was the follow-up the next month at Destination X, a last rights match that truly took the cake in sucking. It wasn't enough to have a regular casket match, they had to add so much crap to it that it ended up being one of the worst matches of the year. Folks, I don't care if you love Vince Russo or you hate him, but if somebody books a match that's so bad, the audience chants for him to be fired? Win the match. Fire Russo! Fire Russo! And you could see yeah. You done goofed. 
And my pick for the number one worst sting moment of all time is Starcade 1997. Was there anything else really up for consideration here? After 16 months of building up the most anticipated match in the history of WCW, after earning the biggest pay-per-view buy rate they ever drew, the company hedged at the last minute when it came to giving the people what they wanted and ruined a perfectly good story in the process. Eric Bischoff has had a bevy of excuses as to why Sting didn't beat Hogan clean in the middle, from admitting he never nailed Hogan down on a finish before the show, to claiming Sting showed up in bad shape and not tan. Um, hello? The guy's been standing up in the rafters all year, not exactly a lot of sunlight up there. The only excuse Bischoff never gives is Hogan getting in his ear and manipulating him into turning one of the easiest lay-ins in wrestling history into one that bounced off the rim. I mean, everything felt off about this match. Sting looked as though he'd rather be anywhere else. Hogan beat Sting's ass for like 90% of it. Then the infamous fast count that wasn't, something referee Nick Patrick is attributed to getting conflicting information from those in charge. Not only did the match undercut Sting, but Bret Hart as well. The Hitman debuted for the WCW earlier in the night as the special guest referee in the bischoff larry Zabisco match. In the main event, he was meant to be the hero and prevent Patrick's fast count from ruining the match, only there was no fast count. So instead, Bret just looked like he was screwing Hogan over for beating his opponent squeaky clean. Though Sting would go on to beat Hogan with the Scorpion Deathlock, all the satisfaction had been drained out of the building. And even though the WCW locker room came out to celebrate with Sting, something was clearly amiss. While WCW was too hot in the moment to suffer any short-term consequences from this, Starcade 97 was truly the beginning of the wheels falling off. Sting was never the same after this, and Hogan was champion four months later. For the fans who were robbed of a satisfying conclusion to a rather long storyline, and for the icon who was robbed of his rightful place as the franchise of WCW, the Starcade 97 main event is my pick for the worst moment in Sting's career. But what do you think belongs in the list, folks? It's time to speak on it in the comments section below. Give the video a thumbs up if you like it. Subscribe to Wrestling With Regret. Hit that bell icon to get all the notifications. And folks, speaking of Star K97, for every ending, there must be a beginning. We are wrapping up Sting Timber with a look at Fall Brawl 1996. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.